Thank you for such a very wonderful and kind introduction. Uh, the title, The Characteristics of a Good Instructional Designer. Let me very quickly say, in academe, we usually don't use the word good or bad. I want to talk with you about a good instructional designer today. So, as mentioned, I'd like to take about 30 or 40 minutes to share with you some specific information but after which I am going to ask you to challenge me on some of the things that I share with you or add to some of the things that I share with you so that together when we leave here this morning we can advance the idea of good effective instructional design. Okay? By the way, there'll be a test at the end. <laughs> I'll give you the answer in a moment. But here's the situation. More people today are increasingly calling themselves instructional designers. Just 10 years ago, the Chronicle of Higher Education, a major academic publication in the United States, did not even have as one of its categories instructional design. A couple of weeks ago, the lead article in this very same Chronicle of Higher Education talked about instructional design. I had good but somewhat sad feelings about that. The sad part was they were talking about it like instructional design was new. But all of us here, we've been doing and practicing instructional design, particularly as educational technologists, for quite some time. This is what we do. So instead of feeling sad, I actually felt good because at least now more people are talking about instructional design. However, as an instructional design researcher, I would say to all of us, let's make sure we maintain a very clear and robust field and study and practice of instructional design. So today, I thought I'd talk with you about the instructional designer. Because while many people identify themselves as an instructional designer, often they don't practice what I'm calling true instructional design. So as I go through the presentation today, I will very quickly share with you one way to think about instructional design. And then of the many, many characteristics of instructional design, I'm going to ask you to focus on three categories of characteristics. But first, instructional design. It's more than just writing objectives. Instructional design, it's more than just planning or moving your course from face-to-face -to, -face to online. Ah, I must be an instructional designer. No, you're someone who moved the course from paper to online. I contend that instructional design is a lot more than that. It's, it's a product development process. Let me repeat that. Don't worry, this part's not on the test. It's a product development process. And I don't want to seem crude, but the product that we are developing or designing are teaching and learning materials. Let, let me just pause there. They're teaching and learning materials that are specifically intended to be used in a teaching and learning situation. This one looks familiar. This is not an instructional design model. Take a close look. It's not even about instructional design. How many of you know about Addy? Okay, Addy. You know, I did a lot of work with Addy. And when I was doing this work early with Addy in the early years, my wife kept wanting to know, who is this Addy woman that is? is he's, I gotta watch Addy. Analyze, design, develop, implement, evaluate. Take a close look. This is a product development model. 
if you're producing vehicles, crops, furniture. Again, let me be careful. I don't want to seem so crude as to suggest that producing learning is just like producing crops. However, we're talking about first, figure out what the situation, analyze the gap. Where are we now? Where do we want to be? What are the actual, what's, what's the, what's, what's, uh, what do we want to have when we're finished? Verify the desired outcomes. D, create, do it, produce it, implement, try it out, see how it works, either in a rapid prototyping, a long systematic way, but just figure it out. And then of course, evaluate. Again, let me mention two things. We're just talking about instructional design. I felt it was important to share this because in a previous session yesterday, people were talking about Addy and the Addy model. Eh. Addy is a product development process and it is a framework that instructional designers or one of the frameworks that instructional designers have adopted to do instructional design. Rarely does it look like this. This is not how you practice instructional design. I think this is a point I need to pause. The point here is that Addy is a product development process. If you want to take note and challenge me on this later, good. Or if you want to reaffirm that, maybe you can say why. But when we get to the question and answer, I'm going to ask you again, what is Addy? Now, this is just a way to describe it. This is how it tends to really look. It's kind of a lot of things happening together. A lot of things interacting. I want to get to the instructional designer, so I won't dwell too much on this, but if you have questions at the end, we can do it. So, how does this relate to instructional design? Instructional designers are people who have the expertise to practice within this complex environment. They have the expertise to figure out what's going on over there. And then based on what they do, they come up with different ways to generate or produce or develop teaching learning materials. So they've taken Addy or some other paradigm, some other framework, and all they're doing is trying to apply it to generating teaching and learning materials. It can look like this. One of the problems with instructional design these days, especially for people who don't know it, they think it's lockstep. They think it's do this first, do this second, then do this third, and you can't start one thing until you start the other. No, that is false. First point about a true instructional designer. A true or good instructional designer will realize that it is a very iterative process, but unfortunately, many of our instructional design models have looked like this in the past. Whereas they really need to start to look more like this. You can still see a type of linear, a curvilinear approach. And then in reality, it's all over the place. Some would say, well, it's still systematic. You can have many, many, many other varieties of instructional design. The book that was mentioned during the introduction. You'll see a picture of it later, but I want to bring it now because while I had a hand in developing it, this has been around a while from a longer person, but the message here is, and I'm going to pass this around so you can look at it. Um, I don't get any royalties from this. I do not get any money from this book. And if you are a member of AECT, you can get it for free. <laughs> it's coming around. That book will show you a plethora of instructional design models depending on how you want to apply this paradigm. Or even another paradigm. I heard a wonderful presentation yesterday about Sam. Sam versus Addy. Uh, oh, 
uh, Sam, I forgot, just that quick. Sim, Sam, who, who, what does Sam mean again? Are they here? S-A-M, uh, Michael. Uh, oh. Anyway, it's another way to think about it. But the bottom line is that however you configure this, there are a variety of models. Now, let me pause. We can have a whole nother discussion about instructional design. And please know, I feel like I'm speaking to people who know these things already. So I want to now move from talking about instructional design to the instructional designer. As a transition, if you really want to think about how you practice good instructional design, let me let you take a moment to read this diagram. This is one way to conceptualize instructional design, where there is a beginning and there is an end, but there are many overlapping components. You don't have to use Addy, but if I were to talk about Addy, because that's now common for us, and say this is analyze, design, develop, implement, evaluate, especially evaluate, what can you see immediately? Just looking at this rendition or this conceptualization of instructional design. Can you see it's supported by evaluation throughout. You can even begin and end with evaluative kinds of activities. Can you see that some areas are thicker or thinner? Can you see that the depth in which you dive into them? There are many ways you can do this. I can use a spiral. I can use a layers of necessity. And by the way, depending on the context or the situation, this will change. Some of the parts will increase or decrease, get thicker, get thinner, but it depends on you and you as an instructional designer. So if someone comes to you and says, this is how you do instructional design, they're not a good instructional designer. If they come to you and say, oh yeah, 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 this is a starting point, but I may need to stretch this part or shrink this part or expand that part. Ah, now they're probably a good instructional designer. Again, please don't accept everything I'm saying just because I happen to be the keynote, but hear it and then see if it has resonance with you. Let me move on. So when I think about instructional design and I think about the people who have to do or design teaching and learning materials, we're talking about a process, whatever process you use, even if you don't use Addy, we're talking about it being learner-centered, student-centered, goal-oriented, generative, focusing on meaningful performance. When I teach this class back at the University of Georgia, one of the first things I say to the students, especially if they've never heard of it before, is you don't have to always do instructional design every time you need to create teaching and learning materials. You do not. There are many, many other tools or levers of performance. But if you do instructional design, you ought to be creating meaningful opportunities for the students. Your outcomes ought to be measurable, reliable, valid. Your data that you're using as you move along the process needs to be iterative and self-correcting, cybernetic, if you will. And number seven, I don't know if you guys in the back can see number seven, but usually instructional design is a team approach. If you're in a situation where it's just me and I just need to create some handouts for class, you know, you might ask the teacher down the hall, but it's just a limited run, it's only four or five students, don't do instructional design. <laughs> just have fun doing what you're doing. So if we accept at least for the next 30 minutes, that this information describes instructional design, then what about the person who has to apply, use, and generate these design products for the good of the student? Let's identify a good instructional designer. 
So, this is what's going to be on the test. Are you ready? Pencils up. Uh, <laughs> three things. A good instructional designer facilitates learner independence. Learner independence, okay? A good instructional designer creates for learning spaces. Emphasis on the word creates. I contend to you that in good instructional design is a creative process. And I'll talk more about that in a second. And then the third thing, ah, C, acknowledges his or her own hierarchy of consciousness. You see, many of your professors up here, they may not tell you, but when you get to be a professor, you can use very big words that no one knows. But I will try to explain to you hierarchy of consciousness. Now, there are many other ways we can talk about an instructional designer. Yeah, you have to have attention to detail. You have to be able to communicate. You have to be able to, as a good instructional designer, you actually have to be very good with people. You have to have a high tolerance. You have to be flexible. You've got to be patient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I should have put that up there, but that's not what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about those three things. Let's make sure we go back, all right? Test question will be, what are the three main areas of a good instructional designer? A good instructional designer facilitates learner independence, creates learning spaces for learning spaces, and acknowledges this thing I'm calling hierarchy of consciousness. Let's take a look at the first one. This is the shortest one. What do we mean, uh, facilitate learner independence? The idea is focus on performance. Let me be very careful. I'm not just talking about manual physical things. You can have cognitive performance. You can have creative performance. Performance I would ask you to consider in the most broad sense. But you ought to be able to say, oh, okay. The goal for the secondary student was to compose a letter to a local organization advocating for a small carbon footprint. So, what should I see at the end of the teaching and learning? I should see the student and I should see a letter and that letter should be written grammatically correct, no spelling errors, to some local organization that is making a case for carbon footprint of which they explain that because people that says that's new, can you see the performance in a cognitive task? My point is sometimes instructional design is mistaken for very simple mundane task, training people to do one thing. No, different talk, different day, a good instructional designer will focus on performance, but will interpret that performance very broadly. And then take a look at this. Good instructional designer. Can, can you see this? Let me let you take a look at it. Let me allow you to read that. Uh, you may not be able to see these words. It says, teacher dependent, teacher independent. T is for the teacher. S, student. Oh, very good. <laughs> What's happening here? There's a, an arrow, not a trivial piece of information here. Not here, but here. This diagram, if read properly, is suggesting that a, it's suggesting a process where in the beginning there's a lot more teacher presence, but by the time you get to the end, the end of the unit, the end of the course, the end of the degree, whatever your economy of scale is, when you get to the end, it ought to be more about the student than the teacher. I'll tell you something, working with PhD students. Ugh. I'm sharing this with the PhD students. 
Uh, Dr. Branch. Yes, what is it? Shouldn't it just be the T by itself and at the end the S by itself? And I said, yeah, okay. But whether it's that or not, understand because maybe before the student came to class, and indeed when you leave the relationship, either in the classroom or the teacher-student or the advisor, the major professor and the student, the student is now on her own or his own. But there are some who have a philosophical uh, 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 different pr perspective and they say, you know, when you start, you ought to always have the student in mind. And when you end, that's a special relationship between teacher and student. Even if you're in a class of 40 students, but particularly if smaller students. A good instructional designer facilitates learner independence. That's number one. Number two, you create for learning spaces. Um, I've shared this with some of you before in different forums, so I won't spend too long, but for those of you who have not seen it before, it's a fundamental premise that says, <coughs> learning in general is omnipresent. We are learning all the time. If you stop learning, you are dead. Now that woke up someone in the back. Let me repeat that. When you stop learning, you are dead. Am I talking about classroom learning? No. I'm talking about just existing every day, active all the time. Your mind, your body, your soul, you're constantly thinking and exploring. And the beauty of this, we as human beings are the only species, that I, species on this earth that I'm aware of that can sit together and come up with something entirely new that did not exist before because we're learning. Sometimes we're just learning how to cross the street in downtown Seoul and not being able to read in Korean, but you're learning. Because if you don't, you get run over by the car. So that's learning in general, but most of us, we deal with what I'm calling intentional learning, or learning where we agree that at the end of the day, the student will be able to do something, say something, describe something, know something, understand, learn, whatever. So we're talking about making clear the expectations for this teacher and the student. A good instructional designer will recognize this, but also recognize that this is complex. Intentional learning has a lot of things happening. They've got the content, the student, the media, the teacher, the peers, uh, the whole bunch of stuff happening. And each one of these is complex. The student is complex. Why? Because it's a human being, full stop. I can stop right there. But we're talking about content, which is also complex. Many of us in this room have our first degree in some specific discipline. Biology, art, graphic design, pre-med. We have an expertise. It's a content knowledge. It's a knowledge structure and thereby complex. And guess what? When you put these two together, you get three things. Uh-oh. One, two. You know, Professor Chung, right now they're saying they actually brought this guy as a keynote and he only sees, he sees three things? That looks like two things. Let me show you the third thing. What's the third thing? That's this right here. The interaction between the teacher, uh, the student, and the content. So we're talking about a person and some knowledge structure that's socially constructed. That's complex and the complexity increases exponentially as you add more people, the peers. And then the way that peer group interacts with the content may be different from the different students. And all of this is mediated, mediated meaning technology as a tool. A good instructional designer will understand these relationships. And by now, my teacher colleagues are usually saying, oh, you've, once again, you've left out the teacher. Au contraire, the teacher is a significant part 
of intentional learning spaces because the teacher is the one that often makes executive decisions. The teacher is the one that is also often taking a look at the students and knowing the students better than anyone else and making those judgments that are ephemeral, that are difficult sometimes to put on paper. Different from the instructional designer. By the way, this is not an instructional design model. All I'm saying is, here's a paradigm. Here's a way to think about teaching and learning, uh, the, the, the space. And by the way, you still want to keep that relationship precious. All of this is happening in some space where there are expectations that are occurring over time within some context. Instructional designers, good instructional designers, they know how to address each of these entities, the dyadic relationships, the triadic relationships, quadratic relationships, I lose count, but they know how to deal with all of this as they seek to create teaching and learning materials that are for the benefit of the student. And oh, by the way, this is not a static diagram. All of these things are happening and moving and going back and forth. So, do you know any good instructional designers? Do you know instructional designers who, when they create materials, online learning, asynchronous, synchronous, face-to-face, -face, large classrooms, lecture classes, one-to-one, -one, whatever, do you know any instructional designers who are good enough to plan for the complexities of learning space. I said there are many characteristics. I wanted to talk with you about three. The first one was promoting, uh, facilitating learner independence, and then creating in designs, uh, designs in learning space. Let me slow down just a bit for this last one, because this is something that uh, I'm grateful to be able to speak with you at a conference like this because I'm sharing this idea with you that's relatively new. So we, along, we together are exploring this new idea that I started developing about three years ago that I called it a hierarchy of consciousness. And the message here is that good instructional designers are aware of their own consciousness and what that means when they design and develop teaching and learning materials. This is a conceptual framework. And to define conceptual framework, take a look. That's a conceptual framework, again, is merely a way to think about several ideas and describe some phenomena. I need to mention, this is not an instructional design model. The next few slides are not instructional design. It's a way of thinking about who we are as we go about our business as educational technologists or as we go about our business as instructional designers. And I will posit to you that good instructional designers are very much aware of these six constructs about themselves. Let me go slow here. We're familiar with the words, but I want to make sure we're clear. The six constructs are phenomenology, philosophy, concept theory, paradigm, and model. Instructional designers, instructional design professionals, ought to be aware of these. Well, let's just take a closer look. So, phenomenology, how do we know? What is it about our experiences that we know? Philosophy, how do we rationalize things? That has an impact on the way we design instruction. Concept, what schemes do we use? Do we believe in top-down schemes or bottom-up schemes? How do we uh, conceive ideas in our mind? What guides our thinking? Which is different from theory, although these days that's being challenged. Concept theory. 
sometimes used interchangeably. This afternoon or this morning, I'll suggest to you that there is a difference. A theory is a way to interpret a set of organized principles. A lot of times you can test the theory. A paradigm, I mean a paradigm. It's a pattern. Um, that, that learning space thing I just showed you, that's just a paradigm. It's just a, a way to describe some reality. At least that's how I describe the reality of intentional learning spaces. The model, oh boy. There's a book going around with a whole bunch of instructional design models. If you've ever built anything, a rocket ship or whatever, you generate models. Some of us in our homes model for our parents how children ought to be. Notice how I flipped that around. Many of us should model as parents for our children, how our parents ought to be. A model. So when you think about each one of these, Phenomenology, philosophy, concept theory, paradigm, and model. A good instructional designer is aware of his or her own attributes in this area. Let me be clear. Phenomenology, it's based on your perceptions. So I'm going to pause. You don't have to write this down, but at least answer for yourself. What experiences have you had that make you act the way you do. What, what is it about our world, our environment, in which you interact every day that makes you act the way you do? Someone in the back nudged someone and said, what does this have to do with instructional design? I'm not sure, well, it's not instructional design, but it has to do with the instructional designer. You need to be self-aware of your likes, your dislikes, your interaction with reality. You need to understand the world around you. You need to be able to say what your philosophy is. And this is very real, especially your belief system. Some of us believe students are to be seen and not heard. That's your philosophy. Some of us believe if a student does not raise his hand in class, they don't know anything. That's your philosophy. Some of us believe that in a class of 30 students, I must have students with an A, but I must have students who fail. It's called the bell curve. That's, my, that's someone's philosophy. My philosophy is, hey, here is the performance standard, and I believe if everyone achieves that standard, then everyone gets an A. But that's my philosophy. So if I'm designing instruction, and my philosophy is one or the other, you will see that manifested in the results of your teaching and learning material. This is what I'm talking about. Concept. How do you describe the things that are difficult to explain or that are intangible? How do you theorize? How do you, what, how do you generate hypotheses? Do you generate hypotheses? Or do you always wing it? Or, well, I'll just do it because of what I know. This hierarchy of consciousness, by the way, it's not, uh, <laughs> I use the term, I don't know, I think I started about 10 years ago, I used the term and discovered that actually it's a real term. It's either hierarchy of consciousness or hierarchy of behavioral consciousness. And there's another term too. I don't think it's on this presentation, but I can share it with the organizers if you want to. There's a whole series of bibliography about the hierarchy of consciousness. I created these six constructs um, based on some things that I've seen. I've seen it with seven, I've seen it with five. But the fifth construct I'd like to share with you is paradigm. And this is one where paradigm sometimes is confused with model. But the point is, you need some referent for action. For me, that learning space bit, that's how I think about people engaged in teaching and learning situations. That physical two-space diagram is a little limiting, but that's how I think about it. And then, 
model. This is where you, you actually do something, you show something. What models do you use? Do you use the Addy model? Or do you have some other model that is your default model? Or do you use models at all? Or do you create them as you go? A good instructional designer is at least aware of these things. And if you meet someone and they say, oh yeah, I was just hired as an instructional designer. Oh, does your company use a particular model? No, no, don't, we don't use models. Well, does your company have a particular format that they use to generate or analyze materials? No, that's why they brought us in. We're going to move our courses to online. I said, well, tell me about your instructional design models. Maybe it's there, maybe it's not. So this hierarchy of consciousness, and forgive me, this is not intended for you to read from the screen as much as to get a sense of each of those areas. So here are the, here are the six constructs. And here's like a definition, and here's some of the attributes that I shared with you. I was remiss, I probably should have did a handout for this, but the bottom line is, in addition to these six constructs, I dare to submit to you that they're hierarchical, that philosophy is based on your phenomenology, and, your, and the concepts you, concepts you generate based on philosophy, and so on as it builds. Uh, paradigm, all the way up through model. Remember I told you about those PhD students? Yeah, I shared it with them. Hey, Dr. Branch, oh geez, what do you want now? I'm not so sure it's hierarchical. I'm not even so sure it's a bona fide taxonomy because shouldn't philosophy come before phenomenology or, or shouldn't paradigm uh, be the same as model or don't you need a model to, and so on and so forth? My answer is, I don't know, but I think you'll make a good instructional designer because you're having the conversation. And that's really what I wanted to do for this area as we talked, is to help you have the conversation and to really make sure that you have a, a clearer understanding I just developed a couple of questions related to this, this business of hierarchy. Here are six questions related to each of the six constructs. So phenomenology, if you're not sure, ask yourself, what experiences have influenced you and your perspectives? Maybe you had an excellent teacher and you want to be like that teacher. Or maybe you had a very poor teacher and said, I'm definitely going to be different. I don't know. Maybe whatever your experience is. What is your prevailing educational philosophy? And I use the term prevailing because philosophy can change. It's not constant. Your philosophy can change. If you think about design, how do you conceive design? Before you rush out to start creating something, what do you do? How do you think about it? How do you decide who you're going to contact and what materials you're going to gather? Number four, do you have a favorite learning theory or theories? And keep in mind, depending on the situation, they may change depending on the situation. What paradigm describes your reality? And do you have a default instructional design model? This is perfect because I'm getting to the last three slides. Here's the test. Oops, I showed you the answers. The good thing about these kinds of forums is that while there's no test, Indeed, I strongly encourage you to think about what I've said so you can debate them, refute them, support them, but at the very least, maybe come up with a better idea about what it means to be a good instructional designer. So my closing thought, what do you believe? What do you believe are the characteristics of a good 
instructional designer. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>